Ali, it's uh, it's great to see you. Thank you. Yeah, long time no see. It, it's been uh, amazing to have partnered for almost uh, four years now. Yes. Yep. Time flies. And, and, you, and your, uh, your both your your execution and Databricks's execution has been awesome over that time period. So congrats. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, you know, right time, right place. Data, AI, kind of. I think if we had started a little bit earlier, we would have probably not existed as a company. It would have been too early. And, and to your point, there's been a tremendous amount of innovation in AI over, over that time period. Um, you, know, you guys were one of the earliest startups focused on AI. You know, also ended up uh, you know, building D Delta Lake, the lake house. Um, you know, at this point, like, what is Data, Databricks' approach to the market? And um, you know, how has it evolved over time? Yeah, I mean, our approach is kind of the same. By the way, there were lots of companies before us that did AI and then before that. It's just I think you have to be kind of on the right time, right time and place for these things to take off. You know, just a couple of years earlier, cloud wouldn't have existed really or wouldn't have really been a big thing, so we would not have been able to be successful. Just a few years later, we would have been probably too late to the party and the clouds would have probably owned the whole market. But our approach, we call it the lake house, the data lake house, which is a portmanteau of lakes and house, warehouses. Lakes stands for basically AI. Data lakes are used for unstructured data to do AI machine learning. And the house part is used for structured data where you, you know, do more the backwards looking, the BI stuff, business intelligence, the lake part, future looking, you know, asking questions of the future. So more AI, yeah. And, and, and ha have you augmented your approach just given some of the, the recent innovations in AI over the last year? Yeah, I mean, honestly what happened, I would say around 2015, 16, we started focusing more and more on deep learning. Before that, it was we were using more classic machine learning, you know, logistic regression, things like that. But 15, 16, we started focusing more and more on deep learning, you know, TensorFlow initially, and then PyTorch and so on. And then I would say 2018, 19, these transformer models started popping up more and more, more and more, you know, BERT came out and so on. So yeah, so you know, we've been doing this continuously. People have been using it. About a thousand customers that use. Transformers and large language models on Databricks over the last, I would say, three, four years. Lots and lots of different use cases. It's just those models weren't kind of, they're not magical. You can't like do interactive, human like, magical interaction with them. You can't do instruction following. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, now that, uh, you know, since November, we were all blown away when we saw the level of sort of interactivity that ChatGPT provided. So of course, we've started doing that as well now. Uh, so it's super exciting. And have you changed anything from you know, a hiring perspective? Like, what, what's the market for uh, AI ML talent currently? Yeah, I mean, we've been hiring ML folks since, I would say, since the very, very beginning. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, there's, the availability has just increased over the years. Just more and more people just go and get degrees and get good at this stuff. They have different aspects of it. So, uh, so it's an awesome market to hire in, in my opinion. I mean, it's never been this good. It was much, much harder in the earlier days, I would say, than now, uh, though. I would say in the last year, most good people that you talk to also are like, ah, oh, I'm starting my own. So, you know, so everybody's doing startups. So that, that makes it a little bit more challenging. Uh, but still, I think it's an amazing market. And, and what are your thoughts on the LLM market today? Um, I mean, that's what everybody's doing. Uh, I think what's going to happen with LLMs is that uh, uh, the first L will go away because I don't think they're going to be really large. Um, I think you'll be able to do these. Honestly, I'm not even sure you'll need a GPU to serve it. Um, you know, the model that we published, Dolly, you know, needs, you know, essentially one server uh, to train, uh, not even to serve it. So I think they're going to get smaller. You're going to be able to serve them on a single machine. Maybe CPU is enough. Uh, and I think the second L will go away as well. You know, it's not really about language. It's concepts that, uh, uh, that basically transformers uh, are learning uh, or the emergent behavior. Uh, so the interface happens to be language now. The, you could have lots of different interfaces. So I just think there's going to be these models. Everyone will have them. They'll be f free, open source. You will have the weights. And you know, it's not going to be in the hands of a few companies. That's what I think the future will look like with this stuff. And I think every company on the planet will want to have one of these. Uh, and I think in every industry, the leaders of the, that industry will be data and AI companies. And they're going to leverage things like LLMs uh, to disrupt their industries. And I actually think also the CEOs in the next decade, I predict, will all have data and AI background. Otherwise, they're not really eligible for the job. Very exciting. And, and, and as you kind of look to create Dolly, like how did you get the idea to you know, kind of take out the L out of LLM and uh, you know, lower the cost of training and you know, potentially not even have to use GPUs over time? Like what, what kind of motivated that? 
Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, lots of people are using LLMs on Databricks for years for translation primarily, but some of it's for summarization, some of it for electronic medical records, some of it was cl claims data, you know, insurance data, that kind of stuff. Uh, but they weren't doing this kind of interactive back and forth. In November, when we saw ChatGPT and kind of were blown away, we started thinking, okay, what's going to happen to this world? And the hypothesis in the industry at that time, I feel, was like there's going to be a few handful of companies that are going to have an amazing model uh, that's going to be fantastic, and the rest of us are going to pay a small fee and access that model behind an API. And it seemed to be, have the, be the consensus view at that time. And it just felt like that's probably not going to be the way this is going to turn out. Uh, that there are already so many initiatives. And also, it's all trained on web data. It's not that hard. You should be able to do it. And you know, we were big data guys, so we came from big data background. So we started actually you know, started doing training on Databricks. Um, we thought it's going to take a longer time to get to it. Uh, but then things moved pretty fast. Um, you know, Llama was released as open source. Uh, Llama's pretty big, even the smallest model is I think 80,000 GPU hours. Uh, and it's, I think it's trained on trillion tokens, trillion words, as you know, you could think of it that way. Uh, so it's a pretty big model. Um, and then, but still couldn't do instruction following, so this human interactivity, the Llama doesn't have that. And then Alpaca, I think three weeks ago, came out. Uh, and it showed that you could take a pretty small data set, 50K questions and answers, 50,000 questions and answers, and you can get Llama to be very interactive. So then our question was, it, it felt like the concept of being able to do instruction following, it's, it shouldn't be that hard to train pretty much any model mm -hmm. uh, to do it. So our thought was you should be able to take any model more or less, and it could be very few parameters, and you should be able to somehow teach it to do this kind of interactive back and forth human uh, interactivity. So we just tried some of the models. We took Luther, which is a two-year-old model, and it's actually not, I mean, if you interact with it, you'll see it. it kind of produces garbage, you know, when we interact with it and ask. So we just took the one that we thought is kind of, kind of the furthest behind in some sense uh, and tried it on that, and pretty immediately we saw that it's, you can get pretty, pretty damn good results. Uh, so that's, and, and you know, were, you, were you surprised by that? Yeah, we were super surprised. We actually thought we did a mistake. So we took a, we, you know, for a few days we were just testing it, trying it out, doing it again, seeing if there was no leakage, you know, leakage meaning, you know, you leak the labels back into the model and you're basically cheating. Like you have the answers and then you're asking it for the answers that you've already trained it on. But no, and then we verified it and we did it again and it's like, no, it seems like it's, it's, it's true. Um, so anyway, we published it, we wanted to get it out. Uh, we think there's gonna be, it's not gonna stop here. There's gonna be smaller and smaller models. There's gonna be smaller and smaller data sets. I think in that 50K question and answer data set lies the magic of human interaction. So you could pretty much that in that data set. And I think you can prune that data set to be even smaller and smaller and smaller as well. Uh, and that's kind of the secret Coca-Cola recipe to interactivity. Uh, so this is just like the first step. We, we, we have more things coming. And I'm sure many, many other people here also have other things that are gonna come towards this. So I think things are moving fast right now. And, and there were some recent reports about you know, Google training their models on open AI models. Like what, what are your thoughts on, on that type of practice? I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so, uh, like, I don't have a moral issue with that. Uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, so don't take my, you know, disclaimer, this is not legal advice, uh, but from what I understand, the, the output of GPT-3.5 or 4 cannot be used to compete with them, to create a model that can compete with them. So, I'll let Google figure, Google has enough lawyers to figure, f figure out if that was uh, okay or not. But I think actually the more interesting thing is this 50K data set, um, it's based on this idea, this research paper from last December called Self-Instruct, um, is using OpenAI to, to sort of generate the, the, the sort of the question and answers. So many of these models right now are kind of captured. They're kind of in jail because they've been trained on that data set. So the question is, is there a jailbreak where you can get them out of, uh, you can get a model that has had nothing to do with the way it's coming out of OpenAI, and in which case it'll be completely free. Uh, and uh, I'm 100% sure that will happen. Question is just, you know, we should take bets on how long it will take. Um, you know, we may or may not be looking at that problem as well at Databricks, uh, but I'm sure others are as well. And, 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 and why did you choose to uh, open source Dolly? Look, it's pretty simple, right? Um, do we want a world in which there's five companies that have an amazing model and you know, it's kind of 
Does it have AGI or not? We can speculate, right? Uh, but it's, it's pretty impressive and it can do amazing things and everybody pays a fee for it. Uh, or do you want it to be democratized and researchers can look at the models and actually kind of understand it and go deeper on it? Uh, we want the latter. Uh, we, our tagline from 2013 has been democratized data and AI. I know it's, you know, cliche marketing, but that's what we've been using. And, um, and so clearly you want that to be in everybody's hands. You want everyone to be able to have these so you can understand them, evolve them, make them better. Uh, I think it's better for mankind if that happens than if it's just, you know, you're just relying on very few vendors. Uh, and all vendors, including Databricks, will always have an interest, like a special interest of things they want to do. We need to grow our revenue and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's why. For us also, it's a complementary market. So, you know, it's, it's good if it gets commoditized for us. And, and you, you have a thousand customers uh, using LLMs uh, at this point. What, what are they using LLMs for? Like, what, what are the use cases? Yeah, I don't know all of them, and not all of them. We're not allowed to know all of them or talk about all of them, but a lot of translation. Lots and lots and lots of translation, you know, generating press release in 80 languages, you know, low resource languages, so languages that don't have lots of text on the web, you know, English, Mandarin, so on, it's easy, right? But what about Vietnamese and so on? But lots of people are generating it in tons of languages. Lots of companies are um, uh, using it to do sentiment analysis to understand what are people saying about our products. You know, you might have a company that's focused just on India. And you know, India has over 200 languages. What are people saying about this product? What's happening with it? Being able to understand that really, really well, uh, these models are really good at it. So there are use cases around that. If you move a little bit over to insurance companies, lots of lots of text. You know, you go to a hospital, you sign thousands of page, pages. Um, what's the risk they're taking here? Understanding that, putting a price on it, that's their, you know, having the LLMs sift through massive, massive amounts of textual data uh, of that form. Pivot a little bit more over to healthcare, which is one I'm really excited about, and I, I think that's going to be a, an awesome one for mankind. Um, you know, electronic medical records. You know, there's lots and lots of those, and you want to understand what's going on with the patient. Uh, so they're doing that, building up phenotype databases. So phenotype database of patient, you know, has type 2 diabetes, so on and so forth. Getting that kind of structure extracted from just this arbitrary text scribbled by some doctor over the last many decades. Uh, and then pharma companies are using that for drug discovery. So we do have pharma companies that use the LLMs on the electronic medical records. They also have genotype databases with gen you know, genetic information, DNA. And you can then do rule association algorithms, which look for what genes are responsible for which diseases. You can use that in drug testing. Uh, I think it's going you know, to be game changing. It's, you're going to be able to attack a lot of these diseases and develop drugs much faster and better uh, using these. So that's some of the use cases that, that we're seeing. And, and what do you think the timeline for that is in, in terms of you know, really, really driving uh, medical research advances? I mean, we're already seeing it. Like, we're already seeing our customers do it. And, uh, and all of them, it's not like, okay, we have one that's really awesome and doing it. You know, you get kind of this kind of herd. All of them notices it, that one is doing it, the community is connected, everybody starts doing it. So in every field, in, we're, we, we're verticalized, so we're in, the, in these different verticals. We're in healthcare, we're in, uh, you know, retail, uh, we're in finance, and so on. In each of them, it's like starting to spread. The use cases start spreading, and they're figuring out how to do things. And as soon as someone does it, someone else will do it as well. And if the model is open, you're going to see this kind of massive productivity uh, improvements in all of these sectors. So I don't think it's going to take long. Like, you know, I mean, I don't know how long it will take for them to go through phase one testing and all that. That mm -hmm. takes probably years, but uh, we're going to see it soon. And um, wh wh when do you think we'll, we'll achieve AGI? Like, wh what's your prediction? Um, I think that's like a philosophical question of what is general intelligence or artificial general intelligence. Um, I think you could make a very strong argument that we already have achieved it. Um, I would be more in that camp that we already have achieved it. Uh, but it's 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 depend on what your definition of these things are. But when, let me just when, when you say we've already achieved it, what, what's your definition? Well, I mean, let's do. A, I mean, actually, I think it's getting into the academic. What do we exactly mean? What test should it pass, and so on? I think you know. By the way, they move the targets. Like Turing test initially was, can you convince someone? Now it's like you have more time, and can you, and can a person that's so you keep moving the target. Uh, but I think it's actually not that interesting. I think the interesting thing is this: just imagine something like ChatGPT or Dali. Uh, it's pretty intelligent already. Mm -hmm. uh, give it Asimov's three laws of robotics and connect a robot to it so it can start actuate and do things with it. We can do that today. That's not hard. That's not like we have these robots. 
it can accomplish quite a bit of things, right? And it can start doing a lot of things. It has pretty sophisticated reasoning and understanding. It can also understand what you're saying to it. Uh, I think it's already, I think the puzzle piece is already there, to be honest. I think it's already happened, to be completely honest. Um, but, you know, depends on your definition. So I do think it's, a, it's an important moment for kind of mankind. And if, if we have achieved AGI based on that definition, like, what, what are your thoughts on you know, any moral or ethical considerations? You know, AI safety is a, you know, a big topic, particularly over the last few days. Do you think we should potentially have a moratorium on you know, you know, future AI training, et cetera? Yeah, it's that letter you know, Elon Musk signed. I hear he also wants to build his own model, so then he wants everybody else to pause six months. Uh, <laughs> makes sense. Uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, I think, um, uh, I think this stuff is going to be amazing for all of us. I think we're all going to be 10 to 100x more productive. I think this stuff is going to be great for healthcare. I mean, look, what are the things that matter to mankind? Healthcare, uh, you know, housing, education, all these kind of things are going to get 10x to 100x better for mankind. That's awesome. We should do it. And it's going to happen very quickly. So anyone can become 10 to 100x better and more productive. But there's also a lot of people that do bad things in this world, and they want to do bad things deliberately and maliciously, and they can do that 10 times, 100 times better as well using this kind of technology. So we should figure out how can we combat that as an industry, and what are the AIs that we can build to stop that as well. And you know, I think the, uh, the sort of antidote is also going to be using this kind of technology. The antidote is not Luddites you know, destroying the machines uh, or uh, putting a, you know, getting some tacit agreement from some people to say, okay, we're not going to do research on this right now, while others are doing research on it. And, you know, it might be other parts of the world. It might be some countries that ignore the ban, and then it goes. You can't really stop research and say, like, we're not going to do research on this. It's also, basically, it's advanced statistics. That's all it is. It's not like some weird, weird, kooky stuff that stopped doing that. It's just advanced statistics. So I think uh, we should figure out how can we stop it, you know, from being used in, in bad ways. Uh, and yeah, I think there should be regulation as well, but I think that's probably going to lag uh, for a few years. So that's my thoughts. I, I don't, we don't all, we don't, we'll see how this evolves, right? We don't all actually know what's going to happen. Uh, but I think a lot of great things are going to come out of it, for sure. And, and you, you've built one of the most impressive AI companies you know, in the world to date. Um, you know, there's a number of founders in the audience. Uh, do, do you have any advice around you know, kind of building companies early on and, um, that, that you could impart? Yeah, I mean, you got to hire a stellar team. Don't make any mistakes on the hiring. You know, if you're in doubt, pass. You know, if there are any, any signs, you know, pass. Make sure that the original team is amazing because the first 10, 20 people that you hire will basically set the culture. You know, a lot of people set the culture principles. What are our principles? Like, you know, I see startups, early startups, they say, oh, we live by the following five culture principles. It, it doesn't matter what they are. You sh don't, don't bother cultural principles when you're 20, 30 people. That's something you need when you're thousands of people. Uh, when you're 20 people, 30 people, the culture is how you act, how you behave in that group. And that's going to be determined by who you hired in that first group of 5, 10 people. If they're amazing, probably your company will continue being amazing. It'll deteriorate a little bit over time, but it's going to be amazing. And if you, uh, on the other hand, you know, you're know, you fast and loose, you hire people, you, know, you put up with... Uh, things that you don't think are great, then that's going to permeate and it's going to accentuate as you get to 500 people, 1,000 people. Around 200 people, things start breaking in a major way because around two, 300 people, um, you hit, you know, you, you don't anymore know everybody. Dunbar's number, right, 150. Um, so uh, that's things get out of hand. And at that point, it's a little bit hard to rewind back and say, well, maybe we should have changed the culture in the early days. Um, so th those, that, that would be the advice. Um, you know, and don't don't take too many shortcuts in the short short term. All the all the shortcuts Databricks took, we took a lot of shortcuts. Uh, all the shortcuts didn't end up paying off. They ended up being you know painful to undo many years later. So just build the right thing. You know, keep your calm. You know, keep your head down and focus on the thing that you're convinced is awesome. Don't get so distracted by all the noise around you. People doing this and. You're going to get killed by that company, and these guys are going to do that, and oh, you have no chance against them, and have you heard of this? Just build a great team, build that great product, and run that marathon for many, many years, and hopefully you succeed. And, and is Databricks open to you know, working with some of these founders, either through Databricks Ventures or maybe you know, aqua partnerships, aqua hires down the road? Yeah, so we have Databricks Ventures. We love to invest in 
uh, machine learning, so please, you know, contact us. You just Google Databricks Ventures. Uh, we have a startup program. You get credits, so you can start building it on Databricks. Databricks is a great platform if you want to just build models, do inference on the models, and if you want to process massive, massive amounts of data on any of the clouds. Uh, it's, it just makes your teams more productive so that you don't have to build all that from scratch. You don't want to build something that, you know, what we have built. You have way better ideas, uh, so do those. Uh, and then, of course, we're excited to make it easier and easier and easier to build, tune, and serve, and do AutoML on uh, LLMs and transformers and other machine learning as well going forward. So we're excited about that. Amazing. Well, Ali, really appreciate the time. Thank you so much.